Good to have everybody here. Amen. Pentecost. I got that on the front of the bulletin. Pentecost, 50th day after the Passover. All right, it's good to have everybody. We're going to continue with our study this morning on the uh, three lives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, all heresy, all heresy, all heresy is born or originates from a misunderstanding of the nature and essence of Jesus Christ, period. Because uh, when you trace every heretic back, you'll always find that that heretic has a misunderstanding or a perversion of the, of the uh, person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's the hub. He's what matters. You can be wrong about a lot of things and go to heaven, but you won't be wrong about Christ and go to heaven. Amen. He's what matters. He is all important. And without him, uh, you're in a mess. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray. Now you give me unction. Teach your word, Father. Open our hearts to receive it. And Lord, give us the spirit of belief, our Heavenly Father, that we may believe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now before I get into that today, I want to read an article that I read from Pravda. How many has ever heard of Pravda? Uh, about 25, 30 years ago, two newspapers that I was aware of. One is Izvestia and the other is Pravda. And these are Russian newspapers. Pravda, I believe, in Russian means truth. And, uh, and immediately you're going to think, well, now you're, you're reading from a communist uh, perspective. You wait, wait till you hear what he has to say before you jump to conclusions. Uh, it's, uh, it's always good sometimes to allow the perspective of someone on the outside looking in to, uh, to, uh, to, to tell you what he sees. Uh, this article is being reprinted throughout the Internet. I'm amazed at how quickly it's catching on. And the reason it is is because of the ring of truth, the ring of truth. Just listen to what this man has to say. And, of course, this does not mean that I endorse the Soviet Union, that I'm a communist, that I'm a red, that I, any of that. You know that. Uh, but what I will say is if the truth is the truth, the truth is the truth, period. And uh, here's what he says, article dated 427, 2009. It must be said that like the breaking of a great dam, the American descent into Marxism is happening with breathtaking speed against the backdrop of a passive, hapless sheeple. Excuse me, dear reader, I meant people. True, the situation has been well prepared on and off for the past century, especially the past 20 years. The initial testing grounds was conducted upon our holy Russia, and a bloody test it was. But we Russians would not just roll over and give up our freedoms and our souls, no matter how much money Wall Street poured into the fist of the Marxist. Those lessons were taken and used to properly prepare the American populace for the surrender of their freedoms and souls to the whims of their elites and betters. First, the population was dumbed down through a politicized and substandard education system based on pop culture rather than the classics. Americans know more about their favorite TV dramas than the drama in D.C. that directly affects their lives. That's true. They care more for their right to choke down a McDonald's burger or a Burger King burger than for their constitutional rights. That's true. Then they turn around and lecture us again about our rights and about our democracy. Pride blind the foolish. Then their faith in God was destroyed until their churches, all tens of thousands of different branches and denominations, were for the most part little more than Sunday circuses, and their televangelist and top Protestant mega preachers were more than happy to sell out their souls and flocks to be on the winning side of one pseudo-Marxist politician or another. Their flocks may complain, but when explained that they would be on the winning side, their flocks were ever so quick to reject Christ in hopes for earthly power. That's true. Amen. 
Even our holy orthodox churches are scandalously liberalized, liberalized rather, in America. The final collapse has come with the election of Barack Obama. His speed in the past three months has been truly impressive. His spending and money printing has been a record setting, not just in America's short history, but in the world. If this keeps up for a more than another year, there is no sign that it will not, and there is no sign that it will not. America, at best, will resemble the, Weim the Weimar Republic and the worst Zimbabwe. Now, let me interject just a little bit here. The Weimar Republic referred to the time in Germany when a wheelbarrow full of dollar bills, or uh, not marks, uh, could not buy a loaf of bread. In plain words, the money was worthless. And uh, these, ta these past two weeks have been the most breathtaking of all. First came the announcement of a planned redesign of the American Byzantine tax system by the very thieves who used it to bankroll their thefts, losses, and swindles of hundreds of billions of dollars. These make our Russian oligarchs look little more than ordinary street thugs in comparison. Yes, the Americans have beat our own thieves in the sheer volumes. Should we congratulate them? True. When they take your hard-earned money and, and through a stimulus program hand it to the banksters and they in turn turn around and hand out millions and millions of dollars in bonuses. How many of you got a million dollar bonus? Raise your hand. These men, of course, are not an elected panel, but made up of appointees picked from the very financial oligarchs and their henchmen who are now gorging themselves on trillions of American dollars in one bailout or another. They are also usurping the rights, duties, and powers of the American Congress. Again, Congress has put up little more than a whimper to their masters. Then came Barack Obama's command that General Motors president step down. I don't think you understand what went on when that happened. Amen. I really don't. From the leadership of his company, that is correct, dear reader. In the land of pure free markets, the American president now has the power, the self-given power, to fire CEOs, and we can assume other employees of private companies at will. Come hither, go dither. The centurion commands his minions. So it should be no surprise that the American president has followed this up with a bold move of declaring that he and another group of unelected chosen stooges will now redesign the entire automotive industry and will even be the guarantee of automotive policies. I am sure that if given the chance, they would happily try and redesign it for the whole of the world too. Listen carefully to this. Prime Minister Putin, less than two months ago, warned Obama and UK's Blair, Tony Blair, uh, former uh, Prime Minister of Great Britain, not to follow the path of Marxism. It only leads to disaster. Amen. Now, it probably wouldn't be too hard to authenticate that. And if that is true, that statement, if that statement is true, that the President of the United States has been warned by the former Prime Minister of a Marxist country that Marxism fails, Amen. that socialism does not work. And if you don't know it, dear friend, this country is headed into socialism. Amen. And George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and Madison, who wrote the Constitution, would roll over in their graves if they knew the direction this country was headed. It's headed into socialism. Let me explain the difference. Fascism, which was Mussolini's Italy in the 40s, controls, doesn't own, but controls commerce from the top down. They control everything. Fascism. Communism... Or, and socialism is the means that it distributes, redistributes wealth. Communism owns the means of production, the businesses, and the, uh, and, and the wealth of the country. Socialism is where all are equal, whether you work or not, whether you lay around all day long or not. Everybody gets fed from the same trough. 
And so therefore, the Bible says, he that won't work, won't eat. The Bible is anti-socialist. As much as it can be. Scripture is. But anyway, apparently, even though we suffered 70 years of this Western-sponsored horror show, and I'm not so sure if you know, you're blaming the West, you have to go back and, and, and look at a lot of things here. We know nothing as foolish, drunken Russians. So let our wise Anglo-Saxon fools find out the folly of their own pride. Again, the American public has taken this with barely a whimper, but a Freeman whimper. So should it be any surprise to discover that the democratically controlled Congress of America is working on passing a new regulation that would give the American Treasury Department the power to set fair maximum salaries, evaluate performance, and control how private companies give out pay raises and bonuses? Senator Barney Franks, a social pervert basking in his homosexuality, You would never hear an American uh, newsman say that. This is a Russian. Just a few days ago, in Moscow, a bunch of perverts got together, and they were going to march through the streets of Moscow for equal rights. You know what they did? They arrested them and hauled them off and put them in the clink. Homosexuality has, was legalized in the Soviet Union, not Soviet Union, Russia. Soviet Union no longer exists. But in Russia, a few years back. But the open practice of it and trying to get it legitimized in the school system like it has been in this country and like it in the workforce like it has been in this country uh, is absolutely outlawed. And it will, they won't tolerate it. They won't tolerate it. There's some things about Russia that when you begin to look at it, you say to yourself, my, 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 are these people coming out of where we're headed in? Mm -hmm. Did you hear that? Yeah. Are we headed in where they're coming out? They've had 70 years of Marxism, communism, okay? 70 years of it, socialism. And they shook it off and said, we're sick and tired of this. They're starving to death, standing in bread lines. The government controlled the distribution of everything. And so, the, and, and so the Russian people are shaking it off and said, we want to be able to compete in the marketplace. And now there's a whole new breed in Russia, millionaires. <laughs> millionaires in Russia who have risen up. I'm not trying to blow up Russia this morning, folks. I'm trying to educate you. <laughs> I'm trying to show you something. There's a man sitting in the White House right now that you had better watch. He spoke to a bunch of people the other night, at a, at a, and he said, you ain't seen nothing yet about what he intends to do to America. He intends to turn this into a Marxist, socialist country. And he's going to do it. And I, as a pastor, I've never taken such a position in all the years I've been. I didn't like Bill Clinton, but Bill Clinton was not a socialist. I didn't like him. But this man... Is, is so far left of Bill Clinton and, of, and, of, uh, and Kennedy up here, it's unbelievable at how far left he is. He is so far left that, that when you really begin to see his position and what he stands for, you, get, you begin to say to yourself, what is the world getting ready for? Amen. There's a man of sin that's going to rise up according to Revelation chapter number 13. And that man of sin is going to become the leader of the world. Amen. And they're going to follow him, and they're going to worship him, and they're going to sing praises to him, and they're going to paint halos around his head, and they're going to call him the Messiah. And they've already done that. Amen. It's such a disconcerting thing to think that he rose up from that country. That's a humbling thing. It's very humbling to think that the United States of America would produce the man of sin, Revelation chapter number 13. Is that him? I don't know. I don't know. But I know one thing. I know that you better, uh, you better take note. Of course, that doesn't even mention his abortion policies. None come even close to him. 
when it comes to the killing of babies? None. that has slowed up the implementation of these leftist radical policies is the economy. And he knows that he has to get the economy back on track because the, the only thing the American, most of the Americans, the only thing they think about is six-pack and sex. That's it. Their God's their belly. And as long as he can keep food in their belly, he can do anything with them. Is that the truth? Is that the truth? And that includes all those that go to church too. Every Sunday. That's the truth. That's what we're here for. You'll know the truth and the truth will make you free. And I'm not going to get up here and sugarcoat it and I'm not going to try to make it look good. If I wind up preaching to five people, I preach to five people. That's okay. The truth is the truth. And it's, it sickens me to my soul. But the church sold itself out a long time ago for a dollar bill. The church has no power. But God has manifested power in here like you wouldn't believe. Because a little bunch, a handful of people will believe Him. They'll believe Him. And He manifests power in here. And I'm going to read one other article to you, just a paragraph. I'm not going to do a lot of reading, but this is a paragraph. This is from the state of Israel. It's called the Shield of David. At around 11 o'clock the morning of April 7th, a Blue Sparrow missile designed to mimic an Iranian Shihab III was fired over the Mediterranean. The visibility was poor. The Blue Sparrow had radar evading capabilities the Shehab does not yet possess. Yet within seconds it was destroyed by an Arrow 2 anti-missile missile launched from the Palmahim base south of Tel Aviv. For the first time, ground crews employed two radar systems in tandem. An enhanced version of the Israeli Green Pines and the American X-Band capable of tracking now listen to this. A baseball 2,900 miles away. Can you imagine <laughs> knocking a baseball out of the sky from the one end of the coast of this country to the other? That's accuracy. That's accuracy. It's almost as if the Almighty has given Israel a supernatural protection that's just literally mind-boggling that he intends to protect those people and defend those people yes, through technology or whatever. And uh, you might as well get ready because Israel is not going to let Iran have a nuclear weapon. Amen. And now the Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, has said that it is absolutely unacceptable that North Korea have a nuclear weapon. And they think they already have it, but, with, you know. So we've got a situation here where, they, where it's, it's, it's essentially an ultimatum. And uh, we could have four wars going at one time very easily and quickly with the North Korea, Iran, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And at one time, the Taliban was 60 miles away from the capital of, Afghan of uh, Pakistan. And if they had overtaken or overrun the government of Pakistan, they could easily have laid their hands upon nuclear weapons. And friends, you don't want the Taliban to have nuclear weapons. Amen. You don't want that. So things are happening, and they're happening quickly. I believe the Lord's coming back. Amen. I believe the devil's grooming his men. I really do. I believe it. And you're watching it. The Bible said in Second Thessalonians chapter number 2, that day would not overtake you, would not come, except that, son, that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Amen. Yep. You're not in darkness. I have never in my lifetime, only lived a few years on this earth, but I've never seen anything like it's on the public stage right now. Amen. Never. never. Nowhere near. Nowhere near. <laughs> Nowhere near. What's out there now? All right, turn to the book of Genesis, chapter number 5 and verse number 3. Genesis 5, 3. Adam lived in 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. All right. 
So the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings. It's where it all started. And it lays down the foundation that follows throughout the Scripture. And the Scripture builds upon this in what's called progressive revelation. <clears throat> so we know that God made man in His image, God's image. Man sinned, fell, lost that image. Adam bore a son in his own image. Now, if you look over here in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 1 and verse number 3, you'll notice what the New Testament says about image. It says a lot about it, and so does the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation says more about an image than any book in the Bible. Don't you think that's quite remarkable? The book of Revelation says more about an image than any book in the Bible. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 3. Who being the brightness of his glory. And notice how he says it. The express image of his person. Whose person? The person of God. All right. Therefore God is a person. See. He's not just a spirit. <coughs> nether. Floating around some kind of a, a being out there. God's a person. But he's a spirit person. All right. But notice it says. The express image of his person. In other words, he's an identical. Express image literally means as if you would stamp out in clay or in, in, in some sort of a, a uh, malleable material the, the, uh, whatever you had, as, a, as, a, as they used to call them, bula. they put it on a document, and the king would put his seal on it. That's it. Don't break that seal. You break that seal at the, at your li at the expense of your life. If that reaches, it will reach where it's going. If that seal is unbroken, the man knows he has received the direct word from the king. Stamps on it. Okay. So that's exactly what it means. It means that God stamped his very image in Jesus Christ. So when he showed up, that's God. You're looking at him. And he, therefore, is the express image of God. So therefore, God must restore to us the image that we've lost. And notice what it says in verse number 49 of 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 49. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly, the image of God. We've borne the image of the earthy, we'll bear the image of God. And there's, there's a, and there is a, there is a, there's a, a, a uh, contrast there's a contrast here. This, you'll see the contrast develop here in, in, in the uh, New Testament. There's a contrast between the image of God and an altar image or a different image. And that's the issue. In 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 15, he says, You've borne the image of the earthly, you'll bear the image of the heavenly. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus Christ, therefore, is a direct manifestation of God. Amen. That's Him. That's, if you wanted to see God in flesh, you've seen Him right there. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus. God of very God. Now, in Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 29, it tells you what He has in store for you as it relates to this image. In Romans chapter number 8 and verse number 29, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of what? Of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. So therefore it is, it is a marvelous thing to be saved. Thank God for salvation. And salvation has to do more with the temporal earth than it does eternity. Because once you're gone from here, you're a different being there. So salvation has more to do with this temporal earth. You're saved, and He's saving you. Salvation is not only an instantaneous event where you're born again, but it's a daily work of the Spirit of God to, to separate you. You're being saved, you see. And cults like to pounce on that and say, see, nobody's saved for sure. They're being saved. And that's a, that's a, that's a misunderstanding, misrepresentation of the text. The being saved has to do with the sanctification where God's pulling you out and separating you from the earth. But in any event, the salvation of this earth is a temporal thing because the earth is temporal. It's gone. It won't be here forever. Everything you build on this earth is going to burn. 
it's going to melt with fervent heat. So all the big buildings you put up and all the great uh, uh, mausoleums and, and uh, edifices and monuments and all of that, remember that. It'll burn one day. And the only thing that will last is what is eternal. God has the other side. All right. So that salvation in that sense. But it's marvelous to be saved. It's a wondrous thing to be called the sons of God. Amen. The sons of God. What manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we be called the sons of God. That's a marvelous thing because that has to do with my relationship with God. I'm a son of God. I'm not a servant. I'm a son. Being a son, I am guaranteed access to the Father. That's a marvelous thing too. But even greater, well, I don't know if it's greater, but even to be in His image. <laughs> Think about it. I've borne the image of the earthy, but one day I'll bear His image. Now that's something. That's something else altogether. That's, that's something that really is. And that's in store for you. And the work has already started because Christ is formed in you. So the work that's being done in you, the sanctifying work of the Spirit, is forming Christ in you, the second man, last Adam. All the men that lived from Adam to Christ are one man. Why? Because they all fall under one image. They fall under one condemnation. They fall under one identity. But the second man, the Lord Jesus Christ, is the Lord from heaven. Therefore, He is the man of all who follow Him. In plain words, I am of not the first Adam. I'm of the last Adam. That's my life. Therefore, this earth has no connection to my life. It has no power over my life. My life is of the last Adam, second man. And as I've borne the image of the earthy, I'll bear the image of the heavenly. So the Lord Jesus Christ, in eternity past, is the Word. He's called God. He's called the Lord. All of these references to the second person of the Trinity. But His name, Jesus, was given to Him 2,000 years ago by Gabriel. Of course, Gabriel didn't name Him. He was messenger, carrying the message. God named Him, but... His name 2,000 years ago was given to him. And what was that name? Jesus. The name means salvation, means Jehovah saves, all right? So Jesus did not come into existence 2,000 years ago. But the God-man, God becoming man, the incarnation, did come into existence 2,000 years ago. And that's the stickler for the cultist because the cultist will find the text that refer to the begetting where the God-man came into existence and run that and say to you, there it is. There's where Christ started. He started 2,000 years ago. No, He didn't. That's the second life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The God-man started 2,000 years ago. For God so loved the world that He gave His own name. When God uses the term begotten, He means it. He has a sense in it that we've lost in some of these new translations. I think one of them says, He gave His only Son. That's not what the Bible says. He gave His only begotten Son. Well, why, why does He say, why, why is begotten so much? Because He is the first one begotten by the Holy Spirit. Very first one. And He is the only one that was begotten the God-man. And that's important. Is, 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 is the passing, the line, the bloodline, exactly. That's very true. That's a good point. Well, absolutely. Because God has a reason for the adoption, and the adoption fits in. But like, like you say, Christ was not adopted. Substance and essence of God. He came forth from God. The only begotten. Not only Son, but only begotten. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten. Uh, genomai is the Greek term, and it is akin to Genesis. See? Genomai. There's so many English words that are just directly connected with Greek words, and literally, so many, a, a lot of English words are pure Greek words, <laughs> just transliterated into English, in, in, into things. Sometimes it's simply a Greek word carried right straight into the English language. Genomai. But you've got to be careful, see? His, his essence came forth from the Father, but He did not originate from the Father. 
So you've got to watch that. You've got to watch it carefully. If Jesus Christ originated from the Father, then therefore he's not eternal. And that's what the Jehovah's Witnesses teach people. They teach that he has an origin. He has no origin. There is no beginning of Jesus Christ, but there is a beginning to the God-man. That's what's so important. And this is why I broke it down into the three lives of Jesus Christ. When we're talking about the image, the image is what is perfected at the resurrection. This is when he is declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Amen. If, uh, when Adam was created, where did he come from? Did he come from above? No, he didn't. Adam did not come from, I'm talking about first Adam. He did not come from above. Where did he come from? He came from the earth, didn't he? So therefore, God had to create the source of his creation. All right. So God brought the earth into existence. Then he created Adam from the earth that he brought into existence. All right. So the earth's older than man, right? Okay. He brought man forth from the dust of the ground, breathed the breath of life from God into his nostrils. He became a living soul. All right. If God uses the first Adam in comparison to the last Adam, there must be a reason for that, right? There has to be. There has to be a reason. Why would He? God doesn't throw words around. Amen. He doesn't put words in the Bible to fill up a page, you know. Well, this paragraph needs a couple more sentences here. Let's stick this in. No. Every word of God is pure. Amen. That's what it says in the book of Psalms. Every word of God is pure. Okay. So why is He called the last Adam then? Well, he's called first Adam is the father of all that live. You get your life from him. His life came from the earth. Last Adam, therefore, becomes the father of all who live, but they have their origin in him. When did the first Adam become the first Adam? The first Adam became the first Adam when he came into being. When he was brought up from the dust of the ground, God breathed into him the breath of life. He came together, tripart being, body, soul, and spirit. Soul came into being because of the entrance of a spirit into the body. Amen. All right? The spirit is immensely superior to the soul. The soul is the life force that's inside you, that's breathing, talking, intellect, emotion, and wills, the, what, the, the three parts that make up a soul. But the spirit is the essence of what you are. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he has justified, or he had just, uh, the spirits of just men made perfect, talking to the, about the fact that the spirit of man has gone on to another place, but the soul is not what's going. Are you following me? Conscience, communion, and intuition make up the essence of the spirit. It's communicating, it's communing with God. The spirit does. This is why God is a spirit, and they that worship him doesn't worship him. They don't worship him in soul and in truth, or in body and in truth. They worship him in spirit and in truth, the highest part of your being. All right. So when the Lord Jesus Christ arose from the dead, God declared something about him. What was it? Romans chapter number 1. He declared him to be what? You remember the text we used last week? Look over there at Romans. Uh, uh, what text did we use last week in reference to uh, into the Lord uh, and to the Lord being raised from the dead? Pardon? All right, now that's good. That has reference to his, his, his uh, being raised from the dead, all right? All right? Do you remember what he said in Psalm, in the book of Psalms? This day have I begotten thee. You remember? He referred to a day that he had begotten him, okay? You remember I made a big deal about the fact that he said it to him, okay? I even use my little granddaughter as an illustration of it. Uh, do you believe a nine-month-old can understand you saying something to her about blah, blah, blah? I'm sure that you can communicate to a, to a degree with a nine-month-old. I know that and, and, and try to. But today I have begotten thee. Thou art my son. Amen. Romans 1 declared to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead brought forth from the dead into an entirely different world. At the resurrection from the dead, he's declared to be the Son of God. 
Death for Jesus Christ was like the earth to Adam. It was a place to come from. See? It was a place to come out from. And when he came out from it, he had something to say like he did to John in Revelation chapter number 1. I am he that liveth and was dead. Literally became dead. Literally died. Literally embraced death. That's the way to say it because they didn't kill him. Amen. He said, I am he that liveth. I'm alive. Okay? You see me. I'm living. I was dead. And he says, behold. Now here's the behold, the declaration. I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have immediately the keys. Authority. By the resurrection from the dead, I have authority. I have the keys of death and hell. Amen. See that? All right. Now he said in John 5 verse 26, he says, As the Father hath life in himself, even so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Amen. The life of the Father is eternal life, everlasting from everlasting to everlasting. God always has and always will live. But he had to become a man to die. So what kind of life did that man have when he rose from the dead? All right. The first man, Adam, was of the earth earthy. The last Adam is the Lord from heaven. The first man, Adam, can give you earthly life. But the Bible says the last Adam is a quickening spirit. Amen. Quickening. Life-giving life-giving. All right. When he was here 2,000 years ago during his earthly ministry, what kind of life did he give the believers about him? Did he give them life? Yes. He said, I've given you eternal life. You shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck you from my hand. I and my Father are one. But is there a difference between the life that the Lord Jesus Christ ministered while he was alive 2,000 years ago and the life that he possessed when he arose from the dead? This is resurrection life. This is when he takes on the full title of last Adam. This is when he becomes a life-giving spirit. This is when he imparts to all mankind that will ever live in the future his life. Not the life of God the Father who sits on the throne, but the life of the resurrected Son who gives life. Life is through Him and only Him. I want you to look at some things it says here about that. And it's quite remarkable. What time? We've got about seven minutes left here. John chapter number 17, verse 2. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given them. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Verse, number seven, verse 3 of John 17. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. First John 1, 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, of the word of life. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. How were you born from your first Adam? It had to be a biological birth. Right? A picture of death and then life. The mother goes down through the valley of death and then life comes forth. So it's a picture of going down into the earth, into the grave, into death, and then life comes forth. That's the way the earth, that's the way you got life from your first Adam. The life, therefore, from the last Adam, not second Adam, last Adam, because there's only two of them. Look at verse number 2 of 1 John. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father. 
See this? What did he call Jesus Christ here? See, uh, if I give you something, I have transferred it from me to you. But if I give you me, then I have to come to you. Uh, It's like saying, you cannot possess life and live eternal life as a gift from God, separate from God. Because the text says right here that Jesus Christ Himself is eternal life. That's what He just said. See what John said? Look at it carefully. For the life was manifested, all right, made known, understood, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, see this, now look carefully, which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. All right, now here's the Father who lives forever. No question. Nobody has a problem with that. His Son, who is begotten of Him in Bethlehem of Judea, is in Himself eternal life. He was with the Father. Father didn't give Him that life. That life manifested itself at the resurrection from the dead. And He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. Let's put it this way. If you take eternal life and bury it in the grave, is it going to stay in the grave? If it stayed in the grave, it wouldn't be eternal life. All right. If you take the Son of God who died on the cross, lay His body in a tomb, and His body stayed in that tomb, would He be eternal life? No. No. But when he came forth from the dead three days later, what did that prove? It proved something. It proved that he himself was eternal life. Now I know the Bible says that God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead in the sense that God Almighty was laid in the tomb. Because Jesus Christ is God. God the Father never has died never will die, folks. Never has. Never will. There's nobody around big enough to kill him. (laughs) And they couldn't kill him anyway. Because he's life. His life. But the life of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, was laid in a tomb. His life. Laid in a tomb. And on the third day, this is the point I'm trying to make about this. Death could not hold him because he himself is eternal life. Now, when he rose from the dead on the third day, he becomes the second Adam, last Adam. He becomes the last Adam, a life-giving spirit. This is life that has conquered death, hell, and the grave. That's the life you'll have in the last Adam. Hallelujah. (laughs) Conquered death, hell, and the grave. Amen. We've got about a minute left, and I'll close. Verse 3. That which we have seen and heard declare we to you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. Now in Revelation chapter 13, 11, Revelation 13, 14, Revelation 13, 15, Revelation 14, 9, Revelation 14, 11, Revelation 15, 2, Revelation 16, 2, and Revelation 19, 20, and Revelation 20, verse 4, an image shows up. No other book in the Bible has as many references to an image as the book of Revelation. We'll study that next week and finish this up. Amen. Brother Bacon, dismiss us, please.